So here we're going to talk about some of the physiologic changes that go on during the state of pregnancy. And these physiologic changes are really in a constant state of flux. So it's not as though once fertilization and implantation occurs that all these things happen immediately. Uh, these, some of these things happen gradually over the course of the pregnancy. And this is going to be really important in building your foundation of having an understanding of pregnancy because some of the disorders that go on are going to rely and be based out of these physiologic changes or disorders of these changes. And so understanding disorders in obstetrics is really going to be contingent on how well you understand these physiologic changes. So we're going to go over these system by system. Uh, any of these can come up on the test. I would say cardiovascular, pulmonary, hematologic, and dermatologic are the most common to come up on the test. In clinical practice, however, some of these gastrointestinal changes are also going to be very important. And the endocrine changes are also, again, really, really important uh, in some of the common disorders of pregnancy. So we'll start out with the cardiovascular changes in pregnancy. Uh, pregnancy is a high flow, low resistance state. The plasma volume increases substantially in pregnancy by up to 50%. Uh, the plasma volume is typically around 2.5 liters. It goes up to about 3.75 liters in pregnancy, and that level is increased even further in multigravita women as well as in women who are bearing multiple gestations. So the, uh, the cardiac output increases during the course of pregnancy by about 30 to 50 percent and that is because she needs to, she basically has another organ in her body and that organ would be the placenta which is her interface with the fetus. And so in order to supply the placenta with adequate perfusion and blood, she needs to increase her cardiac output. Now remember that cardiac output is the product of stroke volume multiplied by heart rate. It's the total amount of volume that the heart puts out. So you can increase cardiac output either by increasing stroke volume or by increasing the heart rate. Now early on in the pregnancy, it's going to be stroke volume that increases the most. Later on in the pregnancy, the heart rate will increase. So the stroke volume increases by about 30%, mostly in the first trimester. It can increase by up to 50%, and it tends to max out around 20 to 24 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, after that point, it is really the heart rate that takes over, increasing by up to 15 to 25%, which translates to about 20 beats per minute. So the average heart rate in a woman towards the end of her pregnancy is between 80 and 90 beats per minute compared to about 60 to 70 beats per minute uh, resting uh, in a non-pregnant state. Uh, so you put those together, the stroke volume increasing, the heart rate increasing, you have an increased cardiac output. Now remember that blood pressure correlates to cardiac output. If you're pumping more blood, all things remaining the same, your blood pressure should go up. But in pregnancy, the blood pressure actually goes down. Why does the blood pressure go down? Well, remember that the blood pressure is going to be inversely proportional to the, uh, the, the systemic vascular resistance, or you can think of the systemic vascular resistance as uh, the somewhat pro proportional, more or less, to the diameter of the vessels. Uh, so resistance is, uh, is related to how dilated the vessels are. I guess you can put it that way to be really crude about it. Uh, so the more dilated the vessels are, namely the arteries, the less resistance you have. You're pumping against less resistance. And the systemic vascular resistance goes down substantially during pregnancy. And it is because of this that the blood pressure will actually go down. So the systemic vascular resistance will decrease by 20%, and if you put all these together, if you were to mathematically uh, put all these together in some formula, you will actually have a blood pressure that goes down despite the fact that your cardiac output, your stroke volume, your heart rate are all going up. And 
All of this is very important because what's going on here is that the systemic vascular resistance by going down is actually going to somewhat shunt blood away from some of the other organs in mom's body and shunt that blood towards certain organs, namely the kidneys, uh, the, uh, the thyroid, uh, and most importantly to shunt blood towards the placenta. And you really want a lot of good blood flow towards the placenta because it's only through the placenta that the fetus is able to get oxygen and other nutrients. So as you can see with the blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure does slightly decrease, but it's really the diastolic blood pressure that uh, sees the most decrease, and that's by about 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. Now the pressure in the veins is going to, uh, is going to vary. Uh, the central venous pressure, that is the venous pressure towards the lungs and the hilum, that's not going to change. The femoral venous pressure does increase, and all of this increase is really just due to the fact that uh, when you have a gravid uterus, it's going to compress the pelvic uh, vessels, the inferior vena cava, and that's going to cause an increase in the venous pressure in the lower extremities. You're not going to see that in the upper extremities because that all flows into the superior vena cava. Uh, but because of the gravid uterus and the pressure that it exerts on the, uh, the, the lower veins, the inferior vena cava, pelvic vessels, uh, you will see an increase in the femoral venous pressure. But the venous pressure itself is not really uh, changing that much uh, due to other factors. It's really just mechanical factors uh, that play a role here. Now, um, I think that's all I want to talk about here. I think I... Do I have it? On? No, I don't. Okay. No, I do. Never mind. Okay. So here's a graph. Uh, this is demonstrating the increase in cardiac output by percent change. Uh, the blood volume also increases. That's also going to play a role here. The heart rate increases and the stroke volume increases. But it is the systemic vascular resistance that decreases and therefore you do have a decrease in blood pressure. Now it's not uncommon, this is what I wanted to talk about a little bit ago, it's not uncommon to have a murmur in pregnancy. However, if you do detect a murmur during pregnancy, it should be a systolic murmur. And that murmur is going to sound a lot like the murmur that you see with aortic stenosis. It's going to be an ejection murmur, and it occurs around the left sternal border. And this is normal during pregnancy. All this is due to is uh, increased flow. So because of that high flow state, you're going to hear an ejection murmur, uh, and that's totally normal. Now, if you happen to hear a diastolic murmur, that indicates that there may be something wrong with the heart. And that's never normal, and that should prompt an investigation. What you should do at that point is echocardiography. That's totally harmless to the fetus, and it can help you get an idea of what's going on with the heart. The cardiac output is going to be highest in the left lateral position. We want to encourage a high cardiac output. That's a good thing. Remember, that's adaptive for the pregnancy. Uh, and so left lateral position is going to be preferable for the woman. The cardiac output is going to be lowest in the supine position. Why is that? Because you have the most compression of the inferior vena cava and pelvic veins. And that's going to reduce uh, the return flow to the heart and hence reduce cardiac output. Remember that Frank Starling mechanism. So women should be encouraged to lay on their left side during pregnancy. When they're sleeping, they should be laying on their left side, if at all possible. Prop, uh, prop up a pillow on her back so that she doesn't roll over into the supine position. Some people naturally want to sleep on their back. Other people naturally want to sleep on their stomach, preferably they should be sleeping on their left side during pregnancy. And that becomes more and more important the more pregnant she gets. Eh, first, second month of pregnancy, probably not as important. Eighth, ninth month of pregnancy, very important. Okay, what about the pulmonary changes? So it's going to be very important that she is breathing more, has more oxygen coming in during pregnancy, because not only does she need to breathe oxygen for herself, but she needs to supply oxygen to the placenta and the fetus. So... The tidal volume is going to increase during pregnancy, so the, remember that the tidal volume is the volume of air that she takes in during a normal breath, 
and that increases about 30 to 40 percent and you would think that's kind of counterintuitive because you have that big huge fetus pushing up against the diaphragm compressing the lungs but in fact the tidal volume does increase during pregnancy. The minute ventilation also increases. Remember that the minute ventilation is simply the amount, uh, the volume of air that's taken in per minute. So it's the tidal volume, which is the amount of air you take in per breath, times the respiratory rate, uh, which is breaths per minute. Uh, the minute ventilation also increases. So she is just in general breathing more. She's getting more oxygen in and she's breathing more frequently. The respiratory rate uh, does also increase uh, to a lesser degree. The residual volume is going to decrease, and why does the residual volume decrease? That's because you have the diaphragm compressing the lung, and so there's less oxygen that can, re less air that can remain in the lung uh, on your maximum expiration. And that's what residual volume is, is it's the volume of air that's still in the lungs when you expire as much as you possibly can and that decreases by 20%. The PaCO2, which is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arterioles, decreases by 25%, and that all has to do with the fact that she's ventilating more. And this is important because the fact that she has a decreased concentration of carbon dioxide in her arteries means that you have a higher gradient across the placenta, and it makes it easier for fetal CO2 to diffuse across the placental membrane and get into the mother's circulation where she can then breathe it out. Remember that the fetus is not breathing. The fetus breathes through, uh, mo to put it uh, in, to, to I, I don't know, the fetus is not breathing, okay? Uh, so the fetus more or less, quote unquote, breathe, breathes through the placenta. That's where oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange occurs. So that kind of functions as their lungs. So the better gradient you've got of carbon dioxide, the greater gradient you have of carbon dioxide, the less carbon dioxide you have in mom's circulation, the easier it is for fetal carbon dioxide to diffuse across the placenta and the more efficient you have of gas exchange. So it's beneficial to the fetus for mom's partial pressure of CO2 or PaCO2 to be lower. Okay, so PaCO2 is lower. And essentially what this means is that she is in a state of respiratory alkalosis. Now she's going to make up for this as we're going to see when we talk about renal changes. She'll make up for this by getting rid of, uh, getting rid of more bicarb through the kidneys. The oxygen consumption overall increases, and this makes perfect sense because you have essentially two human beings with the same system. Uh, so there's more oxygen consumption, more metabolism. So here you can see the, this uh, pulmonary flow diagram. Here this is normal. You can see that the tidal volume increases from 450 milliliters to 600 milliliters. The inspiratory uh, reserve volume, vital capacity remain unchanged. The residual volume decreases, and that's primarily due to the fact that your vital capacity, uh, or your, uh, that's mostly due to the fact that your tidal volume has increased. Uh, so, um, all right, where do I want to go from here? Okay, so remember that you have the elevation of the diaphragm compressing the lungs. That's going to cause your residual volume to decrease. Okay, so here's these are some of the changes that go on. What I would remember, uh, if you don't remember anything else, is remember the fact that you have more ventilation during pregnancy. The tidal volume increases, the respiratory rate increases, the minute volume increases, and so you get all, all of that is going to translate to a lower PaCO2, which facilitates efficient, adequate carbon dioxide diffusion across the placental membrane and helps oxygenate the fetus. So pregnancy induces a state of respiratory alkalosis and that is compensated by increased renal bicarbonate excretion. Progesterone dilates smooth muscle in the airway and that's a good thing to help with breathing, but estrogen, the other major hormone of pregnancy, causes tissue edema and hyperplasia of the mucous glands. Why is this important? Because when you're trying to intubate a pregnant woman, which we want to always avoid, 
um, it's going to be more difficult because all of those, uh, that respiratory tract is edematous. Uh, and so when you go in with a, an ET tube, it's going to be much more difficult to intubate her. So preferably we're going to use smaller endotracheal tubes if we can uh, to intubate her, uh, if we must. And the anesthesiologist will get all excited about this. The respiratory drive also increases due to various factors, namely progesterone, and that leads to a degree of dyspnea in the majority of patients. So her brain thinks she needs to breathe more, and really it's a good thing if she breathes more. Uh, but if for some reason she can't breathe as much, let's say she's very pregnant, she's got twins, um, or some other reason, then she's going to have dyspnea. She's going to think she's not getting in enough oxygen. And dyspnea is very common in pregnancy. Majority of women will complain of some difficulty breathing. Uh, so some things that you can do to ameliorate this is to avoid the supine position. Uh, that's going to help with circulation and oxygen exchange. And then this will naturally improve around 36 to 38 weeks, only about two to four weeks prior to delivery. And the reason for this is something known as lightening. And lightening is where the fetal head descends uh, down the pelvis. And what that means is that the fetus is going to be lower. And so you have less diaphragmatic compression. The woman is e uh, able to breathe much more easily. And that's a good thing. However, what's down below? The bladder. And so while her breathing is going to get easier, she's going to have more urinary frequency and urgency. Okay, what about hematologic changes? So uh, as we mentioned, the plasma volume increases by 50%. And uh, you also do have an increase in your red blood cells, but that only increases by about 20 to 30%. And you put these two together, the plasma volume is actually increasing more than your red blood cell volume. While you do have more red cells during pregnancy than you do otherwise, the concentration goes down. So your hematocrit goes down. And so the range of normal hemoglobin hematocrit actually goes down during pregnancy. If you were to just take a woman's hemoglobin and hematocrit and compare it to what it should be when she's not pregnant, you may think she's actually anemic, whereas she actually is not, because her red volume actually has increased. Uh, so the range of what is normal during pregnancy, as far as hematocrit and hemoglobin goes, is actually shifted downward. Um, that notwithstanding, it is definitely possible to have anemia during pregnancy. Just know that, that hematocrit and hemoglobin count, the normal range goes down because of uh, dilutation. Uh, we would call that a dilutional anemia. The white blood cell count uh, does increase slightly, and that is mediated primarily by estrogen. The ESR is going to increase somewhat, and that is due to the fact that you have more gamma globulins. Why do you have more gamma globulins? Because during pregnancy, there's a shift in the woman's immune system. Yeah, immune, how does the immune system correlate to ESR? Well, much like how it correlates to ESR when you're not pregnant. The more antibodies you have circulating around, uh, the higher your ESR is going to be. And why does she make more antibodies? There's a shift in the preference of her immune system from one that is cell-mediated to one that is more humoral. And that is important because mom wants to make more antibodies. Why is it good for her to make antibodies? Well, she can't confer cell-mediated immunity to the fetus, but she can transfer a humoral immunity to the fetus. And that's very important because it takes a few months for baby's immune system to, to start kicking in after birth. So she ramps up her humoral immune system creates all these extra antibodies and gives them to the fetus so that the fetus, when it is born, has uh, some level of immune protection uh, until its own immune system can kick in. But that's going to result in, an, in a higher ESR for mom during pregnancy. The coagulation factors, namely here we're talking about factors 7, 8, 9, and 10, are going to increase during pregnancy, but this is not the reason why we 
have increased coagulability. Uh, the increased coagulability during pregnancy, remember that pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state, that more than likely has to do with the fact that you have venous stasis due to compression and that there is some degree of endothelial damage mediated by some of the hormones. This is probably a good thing that you have increased coagulability. It's adaptive to prevent postpartum hemorrhage, but this does increase her risk of developing uh, deep vein thrombosis. And in certain states, if she already has hypercoagulability, it increases her risk of developing uh, some of the pathologic states of pregnancy. Okay, for most women, it's not really a big deal. But if she's already hypercoagulable, uh, if she's got one of those inherited coagulation disorders, uh, this can be a big problem. The platelet count is unchanged. Okay, so... Uh, all right, so I think that's all I want to talk about there. Uh, so here you can see that the blood volume increases substantially. The red blood cell mass also increases, but not quite as much as the blood volume, and the hematocrit is going to therefore drop. And remember, hematocrit is a concentration. Uh, so while your red blood cell count is going up, your concentration of red blood cells is going down. So as mentioned, pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state, probably due to venous stasis and endothelial damage. As mentioned, if she has an inherited hypercoagulability, uh, she's predisposed to placental vascular thrombosis, and this raises the risk of preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, and therefore fetal complications, including a fetus that is born small for gestational age. There is a five-fold increased risk of DVT. Very, very important, therefore, that women who have inherited hypercoagulability, that they get up and walk and move around. Uh, if they need to be on bed rest, they need to have uh, pneumatic compression devices placed. The increased red blood cell count underscores the need for iron and folate supplementation during pregnancy. Both iron and folate requirements go up double during pregnancy around that. So very, very important that she's taking supplements, and these can be found in prenatal vitamins. Folate is not only important for uh, helping mom create more red blood cells and prevent anemia, but it's also important to prevent neural tube defects. Iron deficiency anemia is the most common cause of anemia in pregnancy. The symptoms are going to be very similar to iron deficiency anemia in uh, non-pregnant patients. Uh, just remember that the range of hemoglobin and hematocrit does go down during pregnancy because of that dilutional anemia, which is normal. Uh, so the way to diagnose iron deficiency anemia is to get iron studies, and if you have a low ferritin, that is diagnostic. The ferritin actually during pregnancy should be a little bit higher than it is in a non-pregnant person because remember that ferritin is a, uh, it goes up uh, in, in states of... Uh, of inflammation. It's an acute phase reactant. Okay, so renal changes during pregnancy. Uh, because of increased vascularization and blood flow, the kidney size is going to increase by a hundred percent. That is substantial. The ureteral diameter also is going to increase. Most of that is owing to progesterone and its effect at relaxing smooth muscle. Uh, the glomerular filtration rate, because of the increased blood flow to the kidneys, is going to increase by 50%, and that's going to help mom get rid of waste products. Remember, she's going to have more waste products because she's got waste products that are coming through the placenta from the fetus. And so her BUN, creatinine, and uric acid will decrease by 25%. Her plasma sodium will be unchanged. Now, why is this? Our plasma volume is increasing, we're retaining more fluid, what's going on here? Uh, you would think that that should dilute out, especially if we are, if the kidneys are working faster. And the fact is that the aldosterone also goes up during pregnancy, so it helps us retain sodium along with the fluid. The plasma bicarb is going to decrease why do we want the plasma bicarb to decrease? Well, remember, mom is breathing more. She's getting rid of more CO2, and so we want her to get rid of some of that bicarb to balance it out. Uh, the blood pH will increase just slightly. She should still be between 7.35 and 7.45, which we uh, define as normal. 
but it will be on the higher end of that. Uh, she is still in a state of slight respiratory alkalosis, um, even though it's very compensated. Uh, her urine glucose will also increase. Not exactly sure why that's particularly adaptive, but it may have something to do with the fact that uh, she, uh, as we're gonna, going to see with the endocrine changes, uh, she's producing something called human placenta lactogen, which acts against insulin. It's an insulin antagonist. It might have something to do with that. I do believe, though, that the, the kidneys, uh, the, the threshold uh, changes as well uh, as far as when it reabsorbs glucose. So the increased ureteral size, as well as the increased urine glucose and mechanical factors, including the fetus compressing the bladder and comp compressing the outflow tract, are all going to lead to a state of urinary stasis, and that, can, uh, that does predispose the patient to urinary tract infection and pyelonephritis. There is some degree of proteinuria during pregnancy. Again, not exactly sure how that works or why that would even be adaptive, but it does happen. The renin angiotensin aldosterone system is activated, and that helps uh, to increase the total body sodium. Sodium is going to be very important both for mom and for baby. Uh, so the total body sodium will increase, but because of the dilution, the serum concentration of sodium will remain relatively constant. And then lightening, as we already talked about, which occurs around 36 to 38 weeks of gestation, makes it easier to breathe, but it does also increase urinary frequency and urgency, and this will occur later on in the pregnancy. Okay, so moving on to the endocrine changes that occur during pregnancy. We have all sorts of things that go on, as you can imagine. Uh, estrogen is going to increase, progesterone is going to increase. Uh, so first of all, estrogen, the predominant estrogen uh, that exists in pregnancy is estriol. You don't hear much about estriol, you hear a lot about estradiol, which predominates during the fertile years. You hear about estrone, which is the estrogen that predominates during the menopausal years. Uh, but you don't hear much about estriol. And estriol is the main estrogen, uh, and it is synthesized in the placenta, fetal DHEAS, dihydroxyepiendosterone sulfate, or something like that. Um, that is made by the fetus in their adrenal glands. It then goes out through the placenta. The placenta has an enzyme, converts it into estriol, and then that goes into the mother's bloodstream. And that's the predominant estrogen that is made during pregnancy. Uh, you do have, to a lesser degree, a ramped up uh, production of estrogen by the ovaries, but it's mostly the placenta that is producing all of that extra estrogen during pregnancy. Progesterone also increases. Where do we get the progesterone from? Initially, the progesterone during early pregnancy is going to come from the corpus luteum. Ultimately, the corpus luteum will involute, and that progesterone will then come from the placenta. The pituitary size increases by 100%, and this is important uh, because after pregnancy, when you can get postpartum hypotension, that pituitary is going to be used to all that circulation. If you have a sudden decrease in blood pressure, uh, that is going to render the pituitary very vulnerable to ischemia, and that is where we get what's called Sheehan syndrome, which is pituitary apoplexy postpartum. The adrenal size is relatively unchanged, but the adrenals are more active. They're producing cortisol by two to three times their normal level. And the cortisol is useful, remember, because it's a steroid, and steroids are useful for helping to mature the fetal lungs. And so naturally, you're going to see the greatest peak in uh, the cortisol levels towards the end of pregnancy. And as mentioned, it's thought that that helps fetal lung maturation. Interestingly, cortisol causes depression, and that may be what is behind or what contributes to postpartum depression, uh, or at least renders the woman who's postpartum more uh, susceptible to depression. As far as the thyroid, the size does increase by about 10 to 15%. It does put out more thyroid hormone, but at the same time, thyroid binding globulin also increases. And so while the total thyroid hormone goes up, 
the free thyroid hormone stays the same because you have more binding globulin. Why does the thyroid size increase? It's not necessarily due to increased vascularity like with the pituitary. Uh, what's more than likely behind this is the higher levels of HCG, and HCG shares an alpha subunit with TSH. Uh, and so likely the elevated HCG is stimulating the thyroid. And then this hormone called human placenta lactogen, this increases, and this is a unique hormone to pregnancy. We'll talk about this in a little bit. Okay, so these are the hormones that go during pregnancy. Note the HCG has its peak around 10 weeks and then goes down. Uh, the, uh, here we have the progesterone, which increases throughout pregnancy. Uh, initially created by the corpus luteum, the corpus luteum involutes, and then gradually the placenta takes over around nine weeks. Uh, estrogen increases uh, and then goes down, and then, uh, or sorry, that's HCG. Uh, estrogen, yes, the estrogen increases. It should increase because it's made by the placenta. And then prolactin gradually goes up. Okay. So, uh, pregnancy, as mentioned, is a hyperestrogenic state, media of the placenta, and the fetus is DHEAS production. Estriol is a major estrogen produced during pregnancy. The pituitary size increases. Remember that that is important because if mom's blood pressure drops postpartum, she can develop ischemic damage to the pituitary. That would be manifested in a panhypopituitarism. This is known as Sheehan syndrome when it occurs postpartum. Despite the increase in thyroid hormone, it is a euthyroid state because of the increase in thyroid binding globulin. Now, more about this HPL, human placental lactogen. It's also known as human chorionic somatomammotropin. This is a really clever hormone. What this does is it does two things. First of all, it stimulates lipolysis. That's the breakdown of fat into free fatty acids, which then can be utilized into energy. So it breaks down some of mom's fat so that the fetus can use it for energy. It also antagonizes insulin. So by antagonizing insulin, you increase the serum blood glucose. That's a really, really, really good thing because baby is going to use that glucose. Uh, so it does kind of induce a pseudo-insulin resistant state, kind of like diabetes, uh, but it's not diabetes. This is a normal thing that goes on. This is a good thing for baby. Okay, what about GI changes? Now, none of this is really, uh, this is a little bit different. A lot of this is due to mechanical factors and somewhat due to progesterone. But this is going to be important because of the symptoms that it results in. So the gastric motility and gastric emptying time uh, are going to affect the stomach. And the motility is going to decrease, meaning that things are not moving in the stomach as fast. The stomach is not as active. The gastric emptying time, the amount of time it takes to empty the stomach into the duodenum is going to increase. So in other words, food is sticking around in the stomach longer. The gastroesophageal sphincter tone is going to decrease. What does that mean? Food is sticking around in the stomach longer, and that sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach is more relaxed. That's going to mean she's going to get reflux because you got more contents in the stomach, and the tone of that sphincter, which should be contracted, is somewhat looser. She's going to get reflux, and reflux is a big problem in pregnancy. Colonic motility is going to decrease, and then the colonic transit time, the amount of time it takes for contents to get from, uh, from I think here they're talking about colon, so from the beginning of the large intestine to, the, uh, to defecation, that's going to increase. And what does this mean? It's going to mean that there's more fluid is taken up, so you have harder stools, and that's going to cause constipation. Now, all of this is really uh, important that you're kind of slowing down the GI tract because it means you're going to absorb more nutrients from the food. And that's good because we know that baby needs some of those nutrients. Uh, but what this means is that you're going to get reflux from these three things, and you can get constipation from these two things. A lot of this is mediated by progesterone. Okay, remember, progesterone relaxes smooth muscle. That's really going to affect your GES tone as well as the 
sort of peristalsis uh, through the GI tract. So the relaxed GES tone, the increased emptying time, the decreased gastric motility, and don't forget the increased gastric pressure from the gravid uterus pushing up against the, uh, the abdominal contents all contribute to a higher risk of gastric reflux during pregnancy. Reflux is a big problem, so some of the things you can do really just conservative management at first, so avoid trigger foods, chocolate, caffeine, alcohol, just your general advice to anybody with reflux. Uh, you can treat with over-the-counter antacids. Try to avoid the proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole. Go for the H2 blockers like cimetidine, ranitidine. Uh, you can also use sucrophate. It kind of coats the stomach. Um, if that doesn't work, uh, you can go for metoclopramide. Metoclopramide is a uh, it's an anti-nausea drug, but it also increases uh, the gastric motility, so it gets contents of the stomach into the duodenum faster, and that will also help with, uh, with reflux. Remember, though, that the HCG concentration increases, particularly during the first trimester, and for some reason, HCG is associated with nausea. The higher the HCG concentration is, the more nauseous the woman is going to be. An old wives tale, that if you're twi you've got twins, you're going to be more nauseated during pregnancy. It's true, because if you have twins, you're making more HCG. And so you have a higher risk of uh, morning sickness, hyperemesis gravidarum. Now, morning sickness and hyperemesis gravidarum a lot of times are thrown around as cognates. They're not really exactly the same. Hyperemesis gravidarum is very severe morning sickness. Lots of women get morning sickness. Hyperemesis gravidarum is really bad morning sickness. So this is severe nausea during pregnancy, and it is necessarily associated with a decrease in pre-pregnancy body weight of at least 5%. So let's say that mom was 150 pounds before she got pregnant. She's now 12 weeks pregnant, and she's 135 pounds. She lost 10% of her body weight. She definitely has hyperemesis gravidarum. Okay, treatment for hyperemesis gravidarum is frequent snacking. That's going to actually help with the nausea. And then antiemetics can be used. Doxylamine B6 is the best one to use. It's not technically an antiemetic. It's really an antihistamine. Doxylamine. This is Unisom, by the way. You get it over the counter. Uh, combine that with B6, and it is quite effective. You can use other things. Uh, Phenergan, I think, is used somewhat frequently. Uh, but this would be the first one I would go to, Doxylamine B6, uh, for uh, morning sickness during pregnancy. So this is important for anesthesiologists, and this is why we want to avoid general anesthesia. Uh, the stomach is considered full at all times during pregnancy, even if she hasn't eaten in 12 hours. Let's say that we know we need to do some kind of C-section or something, we, uh, and there's a risk that she may need to get general anesthesia. Even if she is NPO for 8 to 12 hours like we normally do it, she's still considered to have a full stomach because the fetus is compressing the stomach. Uh, so for this reason, we want to avoid general anesthesia if at all possible. And then very important uh, to remember that for almost the majority of women, hemorrhoids will occur during pregnancy. And this is due to the fact that you have compression of, uh, of the veins and also due to the fact that you have a uh, increased colonic transit time, which is going to cause harder stools and constipation, which then predispose to hemorrhoids. Okay, and then we'll finish with some of the dermatologic changes during pregnancy. Um, you may get pictures of this on the test, and you'll want to know what these things are. So first off is the striae gravidarum. These are stretch marks, which occur along the abdomen and the buttocks. Why do you get this in pregnancy? Two reasons. One, you're making more cortisol. Remember, in Cushing syndrome, you get these stretch marks. Well, in pregnant women, you have ex excess cortisol. It does reduce the integrity of the skin somewhat, so you're predisposed to stretch marks. And also, you're stretching. The belly is spreading out, and so that's going to put stress on the skin as well. So striae gravidarum are seen in some women. There are some women that are simply predisposed to developing stretch marks during their pregnancy. The linea nigra, the famous linea nigra, 
This will be seen in a lot of women. And if you've delivered a pregnant woman, examined a pregnant woman, if you've ever been pregnant, you've probably seen the linea nigra. It's a, uh, a line of pigmentation that goes uh, down the abdominal midline. And this just is Latin for black line. Uh, and this is due to increased melanocyte stimulating hormone levels. Interestingly, because that melanocyte stimulating hormone can cross the placenta occasionally, very rarely, but occasionally you can see a small, very light linea nigra on, on the baby when it's born. Uh, cloasma, this is misspelled, this should be cloasma. Uh, this is blotchy pigmentation of the nose and face. Spider angioma and palmar erythema are redness, or uh, the spider angioma are these little... I'll show you a picture. Uh, these are stigmata resulting from increased vascularity. And then the Chadwick sign is bluish or purplish discoloration of the vagina and cervix uh, owing to increased vascularity down there. So this is the linea nigra. Now the linea nigra is going to, as you can imagine, be more apparent in darker pigmented women. You can see that this is an African woman here, uh, I believe. And you can see also that there's not only this linea nigra, very prominent linea nigra, but there's also increased pigmentation on the areola of her breasts. And you'll see that in any woman. And that's all due to the melanocyte stimulating hormone. Here is a linea nigra on a Caucasian woman. This obviously is much less prominent than here, but you can still see it. It's quite apparent. And it will become more visible during the course of the pregnancy. Typically, the linea nigra starts to show up around 22, 24 weeks, right around the beginning of the third trimester. Okay, here's stretch marks. Very common. Also note, what else does she have? Linea nigra, right here. And you can see also that, uh, and this might be, she might be post-pregnancy here because you have a fan and steel incision from a C-section. Okay, this uh, you can see here also stretch marks and linea nigra, very common. This is cloasma, see this blotchy pigmentation also due to increased myocyte stimulating hormone as well as increased vascularity. See it again here, spider angioma. You can see it kind of looks like a spider. It's got all these little legs here and again. And then here's palmar erythema due to increased vascularity. And again here. Okay, that is all I've got for you. Uh, we'll go on to some more pregnancy-related topics in future lectures, hopefully getting into more of the uh, uh, management of uh, pregnancy, the prenatal visits. That's what I want to talk about soon. And uh, then we'll go on to some of the diseases. I will 